Today on the big show, we're hanging out with Jonah Carey, who's got a brand new book out called Up, Up, and Away. It's the story of the Montreal Expos. I love me some Expos, baby. We'll be talking to Jonah about, uh, hey, why there were so many great players on the Expos, but there wasn't any great teams, whether uh, Tampa Bay is a modern-day Montreal Expos and uh, if uh, the Washington area can uh, make it on their third attempt for an MLB franchise. Let's do it. Ah. Hey, it's your good friend. It's your pal. It's your compadre. Oh, 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 it's TC, everybody. How you doing? What's going on on the big show today? Well, uh, hey, first off, welcome to the Unfiltered Sports Juggernaut, baby. <laughs> we are all about having a good time. For me, it's all about having a laugh, making some new friends like Jonah today, and not being afraid to call the ridiculous in sports ridiculous. Because you know there's a lot of people walking around these days with the broomsticks up their tuckuses, whether it's in sports or whether it's in life, and uh, no, nah, no. Nah. We're all about having a good time all of the time, as evidenced by the opening day music today. Opening day, opening music, whatever you want to call it. I went back to, you know, Joan and I are going to talk a little bit about uh, the 1994 season by the uh, Expos, which is basically they're probably their best team ever. So I went back to 94 looking for a great number one song. And what did I find? I found nothing. <laughs> And looking at the Billboard charts, I'm like, oh, man. You know what was what some of the number one songs back then? I had a choice of Mariah Carey, a ballad by uh, Brian Adams, Rod Stewart, and Sting, plus either Celine Dion, R. Kelly, Ace of Bass, or uh, Boys to Men, who pretty much dominated the charts in 94. And, and I'm a rock guy, and I need some rock, and I'm thinking, I see nothing here. And then I see The Power of Love by Celine Dion, and I figure... Well, let's send it back another nine years to The Power of Love by Huey Lewis in the News. Hence, there you go, a little Huey Lewis in the News from uh, the Back to the Future soundtrack, uh, given proper attribution to Huey and the guys. Wonderful band. I I love me some Huey Lewis. All right. Hey, speaking of uh, loving me some uh, good stuff, Make sure you swing on by sportsnot.com. Now, while uh, now, while Jonah writes for the uh, granddaddy of uh, wonderful sites called grantland.com, hey, I think it's Sportsnot. We're doing a pretty damn good job. We've got a lot of great stuff going up there on a daily basis. A, a nice set of talented writers that are developing into their own voice. It is spectacular, so make sure you swing on by. That's sports as in sports and then not as in you're the juggernaut baby. Of course, you can follow me on Twitter. It's hey TC. That's hey as in hey, stop that guy from taking that uh, brownie out of that lady's purse. I love some brownies. And uh, TC as in, uh, well, let's see, Tim as in Tim Wallach, and C as in, uh, oh, I don't know, uh, The Rock, Rock Reigns. I guess there's a C in Rock Reigns, right? Okay. Good enough. Finally, if you're digging on the show, got to ask a favor. Can you subscribe to the show on iTunes? And if you really like it, I'd ask a really big solid from you. I'd ask you to tell a friend or a family member about the show. I know there's a lot of competition these days for your entertainment dollar, whether it's Sports Not, the writers there, whether it's Grantland, whether it's Bill Simmons, whether it's uh, Danny Patrick or anybody else out there doing their thing. I like to think that we're having a good time here, and uh, hey, about 20, 25 minutes a day, give it a listen. Give it the Pepsi Challenge, man. Give it a listen after uh, a week if you're like, ugh, this tastes more like uh, RC Cola than Pepsi or Coke. Well, then I understand, but uh, hey, if you'd give it a shot, I would appreciate it, and I thank you in advance. So what's going on in the big show today? Well, we're talking with Jonah Carey. He's a staff writer at Grantland. Everybody loves Grantland, Jonah. What's the deal with that? 
Uh, I just think we try to be different than most content out there, whether it's in print or on the web, where we cover sports and pop culture, which is probably a little bit different. And we try to do it in an innovative and interesting way. So we've got some kind of statistically based writing. I do a lot of that. But we also, the writers have the freedom to kind of stretch their legs a little bit. But they want to look at things from an offbeat way or uh, they want to cover whatever you want to say, the uh, New York Yankees or Game of Thrones or anything they want from uh, from a different angle. And we have the freedom to do that. And uh, it's a good staff of people. I'm happy to be a part of it. Yeah. Well, it's working for you guys. You guys are killing it over there. We're trying our best. Yeah, well, you're succeeding. Uh, Joan is also the uh, author of the New York Times bestseller, The Extra 2%, How Wall Street Strategies Took a Major League Team from Worst to First. But his brand new book is Up, Up, and Away, The Kid, The Hawk, Rock, Vladdy, Pedro, Le Grand Orange. Am I saying that right? Yes. And I, I, I've never heard of this nickname, Yo, 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 Yopi? Yuppie. Yuppie was the mascot of the Expos. He's a oh, giant orange yeah. furball along the lines of a Philly fanatic or Mr. Man. Ah. The crazy ba- uh, business of baseball and the ill-fated but unforgettable Montreal Expos. First off, does that book have the longest title of all the books released this year, do you think? We hope so. We've been contacted <laughs> by Guinness. We're keeping our fingers crossed. Have, have, has anybody said that? I'm sure people have said that to you, but uh, that's the... Yes, it's... It, 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 it's really just a way to torment people who are interviewing me. That's kind of cool. <laughs> oh, there you go. I'm not tormented. Yeah. I was I was going to try to. Uh, so you, you gave me the mascot. The kid is obviously Gary Carter, right? Yep. And you got the hawk, which is Andre Dawson. Yep. Rock Reigns, Vladdy Guerrero, Pedro is of course Pedro. I'm soon going to yep. be. I'm soon going to be Pedro. You know, I'm Reggie Jackson right now, and uh, yep. on May first, I'm going to be Pedro. Nice. Yeah, right. that's, that's I, I read you loud and clear. It's it's not so good. I, I wish I was like Michael Jordan still or or sure. Derek well, maybe not Derek Jeter, but that seems a little <laughs> you probably want to have a little bit more intellectual capacity. Not that there's anything wrong with Derek Jeter. He's just a number that he wears. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh <laughs> the Grand Orange? I have no idea who that was. That's Rusty Staub. He was the oh. first superstar in the history of the X. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, rusty stuff. You know, one of my favorite players on the uh, Expos was uh, Ellis Valentine. I don't know why, but Ellis Valentine was just one of those guys for me. Well, Valentine, I mean, it's not wrong at all to take him because uh, you've got me by just a couple of years here. And uh, that's about right. That's about in, in the wheelhouse of somebody in their uh, you know, early mid 40s. He was a super talented player, so much so that they regarded him as a better prospect than Andre Dawson or Gary Carter, both of whom, of course, became Hall of Famers. The problem with Valentine ultimately is that he kind of threw his career away. He got caught up in cocaine use, which a lot of players did, even though they had drank it. But uh, he sort of went overboard, and then he got hit in the face by a pitch where he was probably not quite 100% with it uh, when the pitch was coming at him, and uh, his career went down a little bit. But, uh, you know, it's interesting. He, I interviewed him at length in the book. There's a lot of good Alice Valentine stories. He's really one of the major characters in the book. And he's 27 years sober now, and he's a mentor in the community in the uh, in Dallas, working with kids and then doing all kinds of good things. So didn't necessarily go so well for his baseball career, but he certainly made a life for himself. In good ways. Very nice. Do you remember his number? 17. Wow. Very nice. I'm pretty good with numbers, but I, I couldn't put a number on uh, Ellis Valentine. So that's very sexy. So one of the things about uh, looking through the book and, and then also looking at the history of the, uh, the expo is, is it it seems to me i would summarize this as a lot of great players i mean just fantastic players but never great teams am i right and and why why was that the case well it's, it's a good question you know coming into the 80s they were dubbed the team of the 80s it was considered a lock that they were going to win you know a bunch of championships or at the very least make the playoffs a bunch of times and compete for the world series and, um, you know, it kind of went to those players. People looked at the superstars. And I'm not just talking about Canadian media, Sports Illustrated, a lot of major U.S. publications are saying the same thing. Gary Carter, Andre Dawson, Steve Rogers, some terrific players. Can't miss. Of course it's going to work. But it's interesting, you know, now uh, in this era, you were in the money ball era or whatever you want to call it, a lot general managers are looking for these little edges. So they're trying to, you know, the utility player or the fourth guy of the bullpen. They really put a lot of attention into that. And the Expos most certainly did not do that. And it really manifests itself in a stat, which I came across in the course of the book. And the book is not sassy, by the way. It's very much a book about anecdotes, stories, and you know, extensive interviews with Pedro Martinez and Tim Raines and Andre Dawson and all these guys. But this stat came up 
and it was from 1978 to 1983, so a period of six seasons. The primary second baseman for the Expos, meaning the guys who started the most often, in those six years combined, hit zero home runs. <laughs> well, you're not going to win very much if you have zero home runs from your second baseman for six years. And I think that went to the philosophy of the team. They did overlook the little things. They had lousy bullpens, their shortstop gold got old, and they didn't upgrade. And then second base was really a big, big problem in those years. I think if they'd even had adequate players in some of those positions to complement Dawson and uh, Reigns and Rogers and Carter and all these guys, you might have seen a different situation. They might have made the playoffs more, maybe even won a World Series. Are you picking on Rodney Scott? Yeah, Rodney Scott was a stylish <laughs> player. He was fast. He was, you know, fun, I guess, but he wasn't very good. He had a lot of uh, lots of two twenties and two thirties with no power. Yeah, yeah. One of the things uh, it seems that, uh, and am I right or am I wrong on this? That it seems that a number of players who grew up in the Expos system or, or who were Expos did go on to win world championships with other teams. He, and, yeah, they certainly did. The famous story, well, the infamous story is that, uh, and I know we're going to get to 1994, I'm sure, but 1994, they're the best team in the history of the franchise. They have the best record in baseball, and the season gets canceled by a strike, so we never get to see it play out. You go to the next spring, and uh, the the order is brought down by ownership, by management, saying, get rid of you know, our most expensive players. Well, the most expensive players are the best players, Larry Walker, Marquis Grissom, Ken Hill, and John Wetland. They trade uh, Hill, Wetland, and Grissom for basically nothing. Lousy players because they're given, they have no leverage. They're told to dump all these guys in a span of three days. Other teams know this, so they take advantage. Walker is a free agent, and they can offer him what's called arbitration, which basically means, hey, even if he doesn't want to stay, you collect some draft picks if he leaves, which can be valuable. They didn't even do that. So these four guys are allowed to leave for nothing. And that season, 1995, John Wetland pitches in the playoffs for the New York Yankees. Larry Walker leads the Rockies to their first playoff berth in franchise history. Kenny Hill is pitching uh, for the what is it, the Cleveland Indians, I believe, at that time in the playoffs. The Indians are on the rise. And probably the most dramatic of all, Marquise Grissom, goes to the Atlanta Braves, the division rivals, and he actually catches the last out of the World Series for the Atlanta Braves. So, yes, these guys certainly went on to big things with other teams. That very year, they went on to big things with other teams. Uh, I have the Expos to thank uh, uh, my, my my twins team, which is currently dead to me because I'm sick of Ron Gardenhire. Uh, but <laughs> uh, but uh, I have the Expos to thank for Jeff Reardon in 87. Yep, Reardon comes over for, uh, what, Tom Nieto and Neil Heaton. Uh, <laughs> yep. uh, not, 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 a, not an attractive package of talent, and uh, he'd done some great things for the Expos. Actually, the person who the Expos got Reardon for was Ellis Valentine. In oh, fact. Yeah. So that trade is made. It was actually a good trade. You know, at the time, gee, how could you give up on a guy like Valentine? But it turned out that all his problems kind of caught up to him. But Reardon was a terrific relief pitcher for the Expos. And this is at a time when not every team had, you know, a legitimate closer. You were just starting with Bruce Suter and Goose Gossage in those days, and Reardon sort of the uh, next iteration does really well, comes over to Minnesota, and yes, he still has some good years left in the tank, even at that point in his career, so he did pitch quite quite well in the Twin Cities. You, <laughs> you can follow Jonah on uh, Twitter. It's Jonah Carey, and the book is Up, Up, and Away, The Kid, The Hawk, Rock, Vladdy, Pedro, Rusty Staub, okay, La Grande Orange, uh, a UP, I, I forgot how to say it again. What is it? What was UP, it? you got it. UP, okay. The crazy business of baseball and the ill-fated but unforgettable Montreal Expos. I love the Expos. Hey, did you talk to Oogie Urbina for the book? I did not. I did not. Uh, no, I did not talk to any convicted murderers for this book, unfortunately. <laughs> Didn't want necessarily for him to come after with a machete. I felt that, you know what, we could probably do without a this book. <laughs> Uh, Jose Vidro, he was having a pretty good career when when the Expos were in Montreal, and then they moved to Washington, and it went down the went down the toilet. What happened there? Well, I think that's just a natural age curve. Vidro was a very good player, sort of a self made guy. He was uh, well, chubby is I guess the nice way to say it. He comes up in the minor leagues, and he's just not really in shape. He's a third baseman, and the Expos say, "Listen, this is your career on the line. You got to." You know, whip yourself into shape, and we're going to make you a second baseman. And, and it turns out fine. He's adequate defensively, but offensively, lots of 300 years. Really a, a very, very solid hitter. Complimented Vladimir Guerrero very well. Uh, but, you know, pitch, or hit or rather players age at different paces. So some of them, you know, they go through, you typically peak in your mid to late 20s, but you'll go to 30, 31, 32, and you're fine. And you won't start to decline until later. Vidro just had a kind of a quicker decline phase 
uh, than some of those other guys. And that does happen, by the way. It's not that unusual for a player to fall off in that manner. You know, you just your reflexes and your, your skills are not quite as good at 35 as they are when they were 25. It was, was, was Tim Wallach one of the most underrated players of all time in your mind? Well, he was, you know, definitely a very good expo. That's for sure. He was a terrific fielder, really, really good. Lots of gold gloves, uh, which was impressive because he was a contemporary of Mike Schmidt, who was one of the greatest defensive third basemen of all time. But Wallace could really pick it, had a great arm, uh, pretty good hitter. You know, with the benefit of, of kind of advanced stats, now that we are, like I said, in the money ball era, we could see that he was very good. I wouldn't say underrated. I would say, or maybe slightly underrated because he, you know, he hit some homers, he hit some doubles and all that. But he didn't get on base a ton. He didn't do a lot of double plays. A lot of the little things he didn't do great. Uh, but certainly a very good player. I mean, we don't want to denigrate him too much, especially the defense. The defense persisted for years and years, even when his bats started to slip. Yeah. Hey, um, are the um, are the Tampa Bay Rays, and you wrote about them in your New York Times bestseller, very yes, sexy, uh, the extra 2%, are the Tampa Bay Rays the modern-day Expos in some ways? I mean, I guess they're the closest comp because they're a team that does it with, uh, you know, small resources, small payroll. They play in the dome, which people don't really like. Uh, they don't. They struggle with attendance, so there are some similarities. I think the difference is just the climate of baseball. If the Expos were still around today, they'd be fine. You know, I don't know that they would be win World Series or or have a ton of money, but they would be fine. They wouldn't be losing money. And I view the Rays in the same boat. Yeah, the Rays are typically 28th, 29th, 30th in attendance and revenue and what have you. That's fine in today's era because you've got a national TV contract where every team gets $52 million. That's huge. Then local TV has become a much bigger deal than before. And then revenue sharing, that 94 strike really paved the way for teams like Tampa Bay and Oakland and Pittsburgh and Kansas City to survive just fine because now the Yankees and the Red Sox and the Dodgers are required to share their revenue with some of the poorer teams. So, yeah, there's a comparison to some extent, but I would stop short of saying, Oh, and also the Rays are in trouble. I don't view it that way. They might need a new stadium. Well, I don't think they, let's put it this way. They don't necessarily need a new stadium. I'm sure the owners would like to have one built for them. Um, but the bottom line here is that because of all the other revenue sources, they're fine. And not only that, they contend every year. This is a very, very well-run, smart franchise. Next time you do an interview, Jonah, uh, I'd like you to work in this joke. I'm going to give you a Tampa Bay joke, Okay. Okay. <laughs> This is going to be death, but okay, you got to. Uh, so you're talking about Tampa Bay, and you, you could say, "Hey, I didn't say I was going to take her to Florida. I said I was going to Tampa with her." Not bad. <laughs> Nothing. Six and a half on that one. Not bad. Not bad. That's a joke I heard on like Rock Line, circa 1985, from Jack Blades, uh, the lead the singer in Night Ranger. Uh, just, yeah, I think it still plays. <laughs> it was one of those jokes that was just so cheesy at the time, but it just stuck with me. Hey, final final question. I appreciate the time. The book is, of course, up, up, and away, available on Amazon. The website is grantland.com, and everybody loves grantland.com. And uh, you can, no? Yeah, no, I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, on Twitter, it's uh, Jonah Carey. Washington, I think this is their third attempt at a franchise. Am I right? Or is it more than that? Uh, is it going to stick this time? Yes, yeah, so the third attempt. Yeah, yes, it will. I mean, we're in a situation. I used to live in D.C. after I moved away from Montreal, actually. And, uh, you know, even from the time that I lived there, which was 97 to 99, it's become uh, even more uh, lucrative, successful region. I mean, certainly D.C. proper uh, obviously has some clout. But then you get into the surrounding suburbs. I mean, you're talking about Montgomery County in Maryland and Fairfax County in Virginia and Loudoun County in Virginia. These are some of the most uh, lucrative, wealthiest counties in, in the country, really. You've got a lot of, uh, a lot of support there and, uh, a lot of corporate support as well. So yeah, I think it'll be fine. This was really the, the last great untapped market in baseball was DC. So, uh, I think it should be, uh, just fine. They got to work out the TV deal with the Orioles because right now they co-own a network called Masson. Right. I wrote about that actually at Grantland.com a couple months ago. Uh, that's a whole dispute, and the Nationals aren't quite getting the money that they should be getting. But I think that will resolve itself. And, and in the interim, you've got a team that is uh, very, very talented to begin with, but also has plenty of support. It'll be fine now. They're in it for the long haul. That, that's what I say. You know, back in the day, in the '80s, the '90s, or even the '60s and the '70s, if you wanted to make it big in this world. You go to you go to Hollywood now. If you want to make it big in this world, you go to Washington D.C. because that's where all the money is, right? 
Yeah, I think you can make that argument. Well, I mean, I guess New York and L.A. have money to some extent as well, but uh, D.C. does have money and it has clout and a uh, very healthy baseball market. I, I think that a lot of, not a lot, but maybe some Expos fans are sort of, you know, it's not the easiest to talk about D.C. because obviously that's where the team ended up. But, uh, you know, I, I view it pretty objectively and I see that these are plenty of good folks there, plenty of people with money and uh, absolutely a viable baseball. You're the best, buddy boy, and I appreciate it. Thanks for your time. I appreciate it. All right, let's wrap it up. Once again, you can find the show on iTunes. Make sure you subscribe if you do. Shoot me an email and let me know, and I'll uh, I'll try to do something for you. I'll do a favor for you. Maybe I drive you to the airport. Maybe I'll uh, help you move, though with my bad back, I shouldn't be helping anybody move, right? But I'll drive you to the airport. How's that sound? Subscribe to the show on iTunes. I'll drive you to the airport. Next time you got to go to the airport. Deal? Cool? Or something, you know. We'll figure it out, man. We'll figure it out. All right. And then uh, you can also f- find the show in Stitcher. You, should, you can subscribe there if you got one of those fancy dancy uh, HTC ones or maybe a Samsung Galaxy. Or if you prefer, you can listen on the website. And the website is the Unfiltered Sports Juggernaut, also known as Sports Not a dot com n a u of course some people may call it sports snot whoop, like a snot rocket whoop. but uh yeah hey whatever you want to call it it's still a good time lots of great content up there you can shoot me an email if you want it's tc at sports com, and you can find me on twitter it's hey tc that's t is in tits and c is in cleavage i always love to pay homage to the aviator howard hughes leonard dicaprio marty scorsese the infamous line from that movie, or one of them, who doesn't love tits? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> ah, man. That's where it's, what it's all about. Once again, big thanks to Jonah Carey for being on the big show. Let me tell you what the name of his book is. Are you ready? It's called Up, Up, and Away. The Kid, the Hawk, Rock, Vladdy, Pedro, Le Grand Orange, U.P., the crazy business of baseball and the ill-fated but unforgettable Montreal Expos. You can follow Jonah on Twitter at Jonah Carey, J-O-N-A-H-K-E-R-I. And then, of course, you can read his stuff at the fantastic uh, grantland.com. There you go. All right, let's wrap this bad boy up. Put it in the books, baby. Got a solo show coming up tomorrow, so I'm looking forward to that. Going to riff on some of the topics in the sports world. Going to do a little baseball. We'll talk uh, a lot of baseball, actually. And then the NBA playoffs are starting, and then we got a little NFL. We're getting closer to the draft, so it's going to be a good time all of the time. All right, let's put this bad boy in the books. Have yourself a wonderful day. And I'll see you in the emergency room. I no credit card or I am this train. It's sudden and it's cool sometimes.